social changes in Europe and America are direct results of the Industrial Revolution, as are many of the changes in the less developed world that we'll discuss in a later chapter. So before we look at the rest of the world, let's look a little bit more closely at industrialization. The last 200 years, really, of human history is also the story of the Industrial Revolution and its effects. The life of a peasant living in France or Mexico or China or India or Ethiopia in 1100 of the Common Era was not really that different from that of a similar peasant living in the same place 200 years earlier or 200 years later. But because of technology, industrialization, and urbanization, the world is considerably different today than it was 200 years ago. In fact, the change has accelerated. We live much differently than our parents did when they were our age. The acceleration of life is just one of the results of the unprecedented worldwide technological innovation and change in the last two centuries. But even today, there are five necessary inputs that are required for industrialization. Capital, technology, a source of energy, the availability of labor, and, and finally, consumers. By the late 1700s, Great Britain had all of these, and it became the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Continental Europe and then the United States soon followed. But why Great Britain? Well, capital, wealth that can be invested to create more wealth, was available to merchants and to others who benefited from world trade. The British dominated the slave trade and the corresponding cultivation of sugar during the 18th century, taking it over from the Spanish and the Portuguese. And the people involved in this trade accumulated great wealth. Further, the East India Company was also a source of capital through their trade with South Asia in tea and in textiles, silk and cotton. The company also was a model for a successful joint stock company in which individual investors bought shares which spread ownership and limited financial liability, and this allowed for greater risk-taking. Soon, factories would be following the same joint stock corporation model in order to accumulate the capital they needed for investment. New technologies also made mass production possible, which first occurred in the British textile industry. The spinning jenny and power looms increased the efficiency of spinning wool and cotton, and then weaving the thread or yarn into cloth. From this beginning, inventors began seeing the possibilities of mechanical production in other areas, such as processed foods, clothing, paper, and household items. Even today, countries usually begin on the path to industrialization through the textile and food processing industries. Agricultural improvements in the previous century and the introduction of new staple crops like the potato that had been imported from the Americas also, like the potato that had been imported from the Americas, also produced more food using less labor. Improved nutrition allowed Britain's population to grow and increased the number of people available to work in factories. With a larger population involved in a wage economy, producing goods for others and not for themselves, Great Britain also created consumers for the textiles and foods and other products manufactured in these new factories. Soon, British merchants were selling industrial products to continental Europe and to an increasingly important market of consumers in Britain's colonies. The ability to sell manufactured goods to a captive colonial market added to the rush for overseas empires by these European powers and by the United States and Japan in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Every nation wanted consumers for the products of the home country and wanted to lock up the valuable natural resources that were needed by the industries of the empire. So a question for discussion. What were Great Britain's main advantages that allowed it to dominate the early Industrial Revolution? 